Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. The Good Shepherd and the Child podcast is going on a season break for the months of August and September, but we are sharing with you some of our favorite episodes from the last year and a half. Today's episode is our very first full episode that I'm going to share with you today. It is from January 8th of 2020. Rebecca Reutsevich joined me to talk about God and the child, and we use the newest edition, the third edition of Religious Potential of the Child, that first chapter, God and the Child, to kind of springboard us into this conversation. This newest edition, it's blue and it's beautiful, and it has Sophia Cavaletti's most recent edits that she did before she passed away for Religious Potential of the Child. This episode is chock full of beautiful wisdom, and I really hope that you enjoyed as much as I have. Welcome, Rebecca to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We are very happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Very glad to be here. Rebecca, would you please tell us about your story and how you got involved with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Sure. I was, uh, after college, I trained as a Montessori primary teacher, working with children three to six. Um, I came home from, I had trained in London, and I came back to the States to begin my Montessori teaching. And at that same time, I was reexamining my place in the church. I had grown up Methodist. The church was the center of our life as a family. But I had not found my place as an adult in a particular Christian community. So when I began my work with Montessori, um, it was in Knoxville, Tennessee, near where I had grown up, I began to also pray about, uh, search for the Christian community that I belonged in. And uh, that's when I discovered, really discovered for myself, the Catholic Church and found myself very at home there. Uh, So I went through instruction, inquiry classes at the nearby University of Tennessee um, Newman Center, and I was received into the Catholic Church um, during that time. As soon as I was, I began to awaken to the fact that although I loved Montessori, there was something missing in the regular Montessori environment for me. And and I noticed it especially one day uh, at the school in the afternoon when the kindergarten age children stay later until three o'clock. We had gone on a little nature experience out in the forest nearby, and they found this very unusual insect. And they were very excited about it. They brought it back into the classroom and everyone was gathered around and noticing its strange colors and different things about it. And I was observing how excited everyone was about it. But then suddenly it seemed their interest just, it was done and they went back to their other things. And that evening at home, I realized that for me, something felt incomplete about that experience. And I I didn't know immediately what that was. But as I thought about it, I realized that 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 excitement, that wonder needed somehow to rise up to give praise and thanks to the giver of such a beautiful thing. So the incompletion of the experience, I understood as the lack of prayer, the lack of responding to the one who had given this beautiful um, bug to us. And that set me on a very particular prayer of, is there a way, Lord, that I could do Montessori, but also be able to speak of God, to address God with the children? And at that time, I did not know that Maria Montessori had in her work said that the fullest expression of her method would actually come in the arena of religious formation. 
nor did I know there existed a person, Sophia Cavalletti or John Nagobi. So what I was praying for, I didn't realize had already in some way been provided. But that spring, I went to a Montessori conference in Houston, Texas. It was American Montessori Society Conference, and they sent us ahead of time a booklet, a program booklet, that had the different offerings each day, the different workshops. And we had to choose our workshops for each day to register for them ahead of time. And then in the mail before the conference, they sent us our tickets to those uh workshops we had chosen. I had looked through the booklet quickly to see the offerings. And for Thursday, I had chosen history uh, in the morning and a geography workshop in the afternoon. My friend and I went to that conference. Uh, We couldn't afford to stay at the Shamrock Hilton where it was happening. So we camped out just down the road. On Thursday morning, Um, where I had pre-registered for history and geography, I got up that morning with just a really strong feeling. It was somewhat negative. Uh, I don't really, I'm not really in the mood for history and geography today. So I sat down on the picnic table. I began to look through the booklet. And suddenly, something I had not seen before jumped off the page. And it was a workshop on the spiritual development of the child, and it was being given by this person I had never heard of named Dr. Sophia Cavalletti. And I knew that's where I had to be. Um, But as I walked down the hall towards the Venetian room where her workshop was being held, I panicked because I did not have a ticket. And I dove in the women's restroom and sort of gave myself a pep talk um, (laughs) that all they could say was no. Um, When I came out of that, uh, the the restroom, I walked as bravely as I could towards the door of her workshop. And the ticket lady had suddenly seen a friend down the hall (laughs) and had temporarily abandoned her post. So I slipped in and um, got to be there um, and hear uh, who we call Sophia at her request. She never wanted to be called Dr. Cavalletti. She wanted to be called Sophia. And I always remember the very first thing that came out of her mouth, um, which was, we must ask ourselves as adults, is religion or religious formation something we impose on our children because we think it's a good thing or is it something that they are silently however silently really asking us for in other words is it something already uh, brewing inside them and they're, they're asking us as adults to help them with that hunger help them mm-hmm. with that capacity Anyway, I knew instantly that this was for me, and I pulled out of my pocket diary, which I would never be caught without, and I wrote in red ink, um, today my life has changed. Um, oh, wow. This is for me. And uh, a year later, I managed to pull it off and go to do the two-year, uh, at that time it was a two-year course of study for children ages 3 to 12 never looked back since. That was in 19, I met Sophia in 1978. I went to Rome in 1979 and finished my work there in 1981. So I've continued for these past almost 40 years to be a catechist of children and a formation leader for adults. So you lived in Italy with Sophia and Gianna for two years? Yes, I did. Um, I wrote Sophia ahead of time and said, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I would need to have a live-in arrangement with a family that I could get room and board in exchange for some English lessons. Uh, She found me a family. Uh, Their oldest daughter came to the atrium. 
uh, had a marvelous experience. Uh, none of them really spoke English in the family. Um, the children, um, you know, were studying it in, in school. So they, but they were shy about speaking it. So I helped them with their homework and I struggled to learn Italian because I did not know Italian when I went. So that was a major challenge for me. Yeah. What an experience. So I'm curious, what was Sophia's answer to that question at the conference about, um, is it justifiable for us to impose religious education on children? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the whole premise of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. It was inspired not by a theory, as some many people know. Sophia was not a, she had no background in child development, mm -hmm. none in education. She was a quintessential biblical scholar. Yeah. But a friend had asked her to do something about, you know, with the Bible, with a, a nephew and a couple of his little friends. So Sophia agreed really just to, to be nice, you know, to her friend. And yet, she was completely astounded by the depth of interest and delight that those three approximately six-year-old boys took in really seriously reading uh, the Bible. Uh, she started with Genesis, and it was that experience of seeing with her own eyes the richness within the child, the capability within the child. That's what spurred this work. And so, yes, the answer is it is all based on observation of children and what the children have shown us they hunger for. The culture, the world serves them uh, intellectual food, entertainment, um, you know, uh, lots of uh, exercise and development of, of uh, athletic ability. But the world in general uh, has not regarded their capacity and need for that experience of mystery and relationship with God in a more vital way. And that's, that's what she recognized. They are asking. So one of our uh, sort of mottos is we hear the silent plea of the child, help me draw closer to God by myself, which doesn't mean they don't need adults. They do. The Christian faith is one that must be proclaimed mm -hmm. by parents, by catechists, by fellow members in the, in the Christian community. But it's the way we offer that help that makes all the difference. And so the whole catechesis of the Good Shepherd is rooted in that silent plea of the child and the search for the appropriate way to give them the tools they need for their own personal meditation and re their own relationship with God. Mm -hmm. yeah, Sophia talks a lot in her book about these responses that the children have to when they encounter God, but in nature or in a story or um, somebody just mentioning him and this internal joy that the children manifest just innately. It wasn't taught to them. It wasn't part of their environment all the time. I, I love listening to those stories. Yes, that's, uh, that's certainly the great, greatest, really, richness of the her first book about the children, The Religious Potential of the Child, um, Scripture and Liturgy, uh, the one that's devoted to the child before six and that has very recently, in fact, I think it's just now in the pipeline to reach us, uh, it's been republished, uh, updated, uh, but that's the great richness of that book, is that it's really a document about the child. It's the child's responses, the child's artwork, uh, their verbal responses, their artwork, the ways we have been able to, as Sophia says, have a glimpse 
into the richness of their inner life with with God. Um, she chapter one, God and the child is so rich that I, I've sometimes gotten a little uh, nervous that people will look and go, this is, this is uh, kind of weird even because it's such depth that uh, where she's recounting children's responses. And yet they have yeah. learned through the years. They saw that if they are placed in uh, you know, the right environment, be it in the natural world or in an atrium, their God-given inner abilities, uh, intuitive abilities, spiritual abilities, they have experiences of God that cannot be attributed to what their parents taught them, to what even the church. Many of the uh, examples she gives in that chapter are of children with atheist parents, parents who are atheist or mm -hmm. uh, have had no religious instruction. Uh, my favorite being the little girl who at three years old, living in an, um, a family where there was no religious uh, belief, uh, suddenly asked her father, where did the world come from? And he went through various explanations, mm -hmm. uh, more materialistic, you know, scientific, whatever. But at the very end of his discourse, he said, and some people believe that a, a being named God created everything. And, you know, the little girl, um, you know, burst out with enthusiasm saying, um, I knew it, it was a lie. I knew it was a lie. It is him. It is him. And so this is the great mystery, isn't it? Yes. We have so underestimated the child's capabilities and their religious um, or in spiritual connection that they already have. Um, we've been taught that it's our duty to impose all this knowledge onto the child. And through this work of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and what God has revealed to Sophia and Gianna, that they already have it. It's just a matter of fostering it. And it's, I love that. Yes. Um, it really, I've th what I've thought a lot about over the years is how we, in the church, we baptize an infant. And in that baptism, <laughs> they receive the Holy Spirit. And yet, mm -hmm. we tend to act as if they do not have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is the quintessential teacher. And, it, and if we think in that way that of the child, as, as Montessori said, the child is not an empty vase or an empty receptacle that we have to fill up, but that already they have within them, just as you said, they have what Montessori called the spiritual embryo. They have... Uh, God's presence within them already. So our help to them, our assistance to them has to reflect that, the way we try to help them. I know back in the early 90s when liturgy training publications asked me to look at what they had for parent education, preparing for the baptism of their child, um, they sent me their what they had been using and asked me to read through it and um, make comments on it and make a proposal for how it could be, um, you know, rewritten or revised. And what struck me most in reading what they already had was the term that kept being used, parent God, parent uh, hyphen God. And I thought, ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, I, I had become, since my Rome training, mm -hmm. a parent myself. And the idea that I am my parents' God, that I'm the only way that my, my child can know God, was terrifying <laughs> and untrue, I think. And I knew that. Um, so it's, can we acknowledge that the child is, as you said, already in relationship with God, already in a communication, they do need something from us, right? 
and but it's not instruction so much as they need to live close to someone who has a relationship with God, who can pray with them, but also can make those announcements with joy, not instruct, but proclaim and delight in uh, so that there is this communal enjoyment of God between parents and and the children. But we have to start with that, uh, do we believe or do we not believe the child? Uh, has God within and has that spirit already teaching them. Trust that the spirit is doing what it, we believe the Holy Spirit is doing. Yes. I yes. love that. So yes. our role as parents and catechists and adults in children's life is more important to be a witness, a co-witness with the child, a co-listener with the child, yes. not the instructor itself, but to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and the child next to each other. I love that. Yes. I love yes. that. That's, that's wonderful. Mm. And that's so countercultural for today. It is. And that's one of the first things we have to accept when we uh, sign on to being trained as a catechist when we spend so much time. It is very involved. The children are worth it. Uh, but mm -hmm. the training, the to be fully trained, um, of course, none of us mind because it's really our own formation. Uh, there's nothing about the, the form, being formed in the catechesis that uh, we, we could say, oh, that's just what I do with children. No, it is faith formation for everyone who touches it. But one of the things we first have to come to terms with in signing on to this very involved journey is it is very countercultural. Um, it, it, it has been difficult for me, I admit, mm -hmm. over the years in some parishes where I've been that the pastor himself doesn't get it, doesn't understand how rich the child is yeah. in their own right. And so it, it, we have to get used to um, the fact that we're, we're doing this work where the prevailing model is Sunday school, where the teacher is in control, the teacher has all the, the answers mm -hmm. and all the plans, and the child is a passive recipient of that. Yes, they might be given something, an activity to do, because I would hope almost everyone knows that children need to be active. They need to do something. But the prevailing attitude in conventional education does seem to be that the, the adult is in control, needs to be in control, and uh, deliver the lesson. But Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, just as you said, is, is a very different discipline. It is to be that, yes, prepare the environment because the environment is huge, um, but also to be a co-listener, to make the announcement, to provide a material for the children, to be a guide of sorts. But we acknowledge that it's really at the inner dialogue that is sparked between the child and God that really forms them. Yes. And I, I love to imagine that first encounter Sophia had with those children at her house, that that's what she did. And that's what sparked so much joy in those child is this adult was sitting next to them going, wow, right. listen to this right. verse. Wow. And it made the children draw right. towards that scripture by her just reading it and her herself having an encounter with that with the scripture as well right and and the element that one of the elements i think that's least understood is the child montessori said when the child was given serious and important things like the mysteries of our faith in a dignified way, not in a what we often call child-friendly way. I mean, usually that means entertainment with entertainment value. We have to captivate them with our 
you know, dram dramatic uh, presentations and show them uh, fun things that, that stimulate their interest. But Sophia's presentation to those boys was exactly the opposite. Sophia didn't know what else to do, so she meditated with them on the scripture just like she would with adult students with dignity with solemnity that's mm -hmm. a big word in catechesis it's just that mm -hmm. the children need that because the world does not offer that uh, tone that tone of seriousness of importance um, and yes they they will burst out in song they're still children but uh, you know, they also are very wise and they know when the adult is trying to entertain them, they know the difference. Instead of just reading, that, doing that, what we call solemn reading of the, of the text from the Bible or solemnly mm -hmm. demonstrating a gesture from the Mass, they know the difference in something for, that's just for entertainment or... Uh, enticing them into to be interested. Um, and this is, again, Montessori said that if you give children what they really need, you'll see a new dignity as well as a new joy. Mm -hmm. And it's a different type of joy. It's not the same joy that a child will have on Christmas morning. It's, yes. it's more of an internal peaceful joy. Yeah, Sophia often spoke about um, to us about learning to discern the difference between real joy and what we would call a typical child's excitement. You know, mm -hmm. so we we use the word happy rather loosely, and we say, "Oh, you know." Uh, he was so happy with his birthday present. She was so happy with her new puppy. Of course, there is that emotional excitement, and it's a good thing. But the joy we're talking about, the fruit of the child's coming close to God, of the child being allowed to dwell with that inner teacher, that joy is marked not by squeals of delight, but it's marked by a settling of the whole body. It's marked by mm -hmm. a peacefulness and by an interest to engage in work. Uh, it, it's very different than the, the normal. One of the things she said that I appreciated most, she said, you know, a child can go to a a birthday party and they're very excited and we say very happy to be going to this party and they go to the party and they have so much fun and they eat the cake and they play with their friends. But what happens afterwards? Usually that excitement dissipates and it dissipates and becomes at least back home irritability. Uh, the child is more exhausted by that kind of excitement. Whereas the experience the child has in the atrium or at home before the prayer table with the family is a calming, peaceful, but also it refocuses their attention um, rather than, you know, rather than cause this uh, decline into irritability. Mm -hmm. She, I'm loved through the years. Um, watching children, observing children in the atrium after a particular presentation that they have, that has especially fed them, you'll hear these little sighs. Mm. And for me, that's become one of the most eloquent prayers. It's just, you know, they're so settled. Um, or as Sophia quotes a little girl who, after a particular presentation, said, my body is happy. Again, indicative of a, of a sense of well-being, being at peace. Yeah. In that chapter, um, God and the Child, Sophia says <clears throat> that children's response is not 
always with words. It's right. with um, that. It's an internal feelings that they have with their bodies. And <clears throat> so right. we can't always expect them to express it with words, but those sighs, those inner peace that you're talking about, that's, that's the child's response. Yes. That's the child's joy and right. peace that we're looking for. What about those children <clears throat> in your experience over the last 40 years, those children that you don't see find that peace in the atrium or after a prayer experience? Yeah. One of the things that uh, formation in this work uh, as a catechist um, enables you to do is to understand, um, you know, the goal, but you must be able to meet each child where they are. And that is a whole different discipline. And it includes mm -hmm. relinquishing your adult expectations. It, it means a profound patience because the fact is children come into the atrium from a variety of experiences. And in our modern culture, it's often from a broken home or, a, you know, a single parent home. It's uh, maybe a, a family that is just always plugged in to Internet, to, uh, you know, and a different activity, a le different lesson, soccer, ballet, all these multiple things. There are many reasons why a child comes to the atrium not disposed immediately to silence, to choosing work, and so forth. So it just means we work harder at helping them find. Montessori said it's through the work of the hands that the child becomes engaged. I've been working for five years uh, with the Missionaries of Charity here in Memphis, and we started an atrium five years ago. And they would go out, they, they'd still go out, I'm still there, on a Saturday morning, they go out in the van, and they pick up these children from various housing projects around. They come in, these children are from situations that you and I and, you know, many of the people we work with are completely, uh, you know, unexposed to. Right? So when they first arrive, they are mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. unsettled than the children I work with in the parish. That's when you know that that work of the hands, the practical life work, like those are the children that I immediately get involved in helping to arrange the flowers for the prayer table or polish the candlestick. This is another area of the catechesis that's least understood. The importance, mm -hmm. as Montessori had put out uh, before, had spoken of before, of practical life, uh, l activities of daily life, which immediately mo it has the quickest result um, but then in working in that situation one becomes very comfortable with what they need may not correspond to the syllabus uh, for that age child for example a 10 year old might come in he's never been in an atrium He's never been in an ordered home environment. But this child spots the race surface map of the land of Israel. The race surface map of the land of Israel is, is for the younger ones, the little ones. But he sees it, and it's a match. He goes right over to it and begins to feel it. To I show, So I, I recognize that as a sign. This is what calls to him. And I go over and I begin to tell him, you know, this is Nazareth. This is where. And show him the flags. And from that connection, his name was Courtney. Courtney went on every week 
to look for something that he was interested in because that connection was so strong. So in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we have to be very accepting of the state children come to us. And we have to be willing to give them time. We have Mm -hmm. to be willing to help them as much as they need help towards that goal that they will be able to receive the gifts that are being offered to them. Uh, But this is about meeting the child. It's not about just delivering this beautiful content. We have to know that our work is also about helping Mm -hmm. the child arrive at that place where they can receive the gifts being offered. Mm -hmm. It's back to that dignity of the child that you are giving them by respecting that inner voice of what they are being called to and trusting that with that, that is where they're going to find peace and healing in many areas of their life. I love that. That is so beautiful. Sophia also talks about a metaphysical child. Can you speak into that a little bit more? What is a metaphysical child? Yes, I I love to talk about that term because I'm very aware uh, that that is a very highfalutin uh, philosophical term. And it would turn many people off. Metaphysical. What are you talking about? But it's such an important word. It identifies something Maria Montessori identified, and that is crucial in our understanding of the child as to what feeds them, what nourishes them most. So the simplest definition from a catechesis of the Good Shepherd perspective is that a metaphysical child means they are simultaneously very attuned to sensorial, physical reality. They feel, they smell, they see, they're alive to the senses. But at the same time, they have a sense of the infinite, of the transcendent, of the invisible. And As adults, we tend to be one or the other (laughs) or neither. We we often tend Mm -hmm. to be either very uh, live in our heads, we say, and be thinking about, you know, things all the time and not noticing or feeling or taking in the the sensory data of our experience of being human. Right. But the little child has this marvelous Uh, unity within of the physical reality and the transcendent reality. So the example I always give in my formation courses is of my own son, John, when he was between two and two and a half. And we had gone on a walk one day to the park, which was just a couple of blocks from our home. And on the way back, I was looking out ahead and I saw something on the sidewalk, which I immediately knew was a dead something, probably a dead bird. And my immediate instinct as a parent of a young, young child was to take his hand and try to cross the street. But he had spotted it also. So he tugged back and like, no, I want to see what this is. So we go up to the dead bird on the sidewalk, and he immediately leans down towards it. Just his brow was all furrowed, and he was clearly completely mesmerized by the dead bird. And all I said was, yes, John, that's a dead bird. And he began to repeat. You know, they're in a very sensitive period for language at that age, and so he just began to repeat dead bird, dead bird. I said nothing more, but after a minute or two of looking at the dead bird, he suddenly stood up and craned his neck to begin looking in the sky and in the treetops. What was he looking for? He was looking for a live bird. He was contemplating the mystery of life and death. Uh, Sophia begins chapter one of the second religious potential 
uh, uh, that focuses on the six to 12 child. And the very first chapter is called The Big Questions. The youngest children ask the really biggest questions. They are natural contemplatives. So why is this metaphysical child so important? For one thing, it means that we don't have to explain when we show them that tiny mustard seed. Jesus said the kingdom is like that mustard seed. And once it is planted, it grows into the largest of shrubs. We can simply read that from the Bible and then take that teeny tiny speck out of the container and put one on their finger. And then we show them a picture of a full-grown mustard tree. When they look at that little seed, first of all, when adults look at it, adults do something like, oh, oh, wow, I never knew it was that small. Oh, that's interesting. But a little child looks at that teeny tiny speck and goes, oh. They feel it in their bodies, the awesomeness of that mystery. Mm -hmm. They look at that full-grown tree. They look at that tiny speck. And without any rational explanation, they feel the magnitude of that mystery. Also, mm -hmm. it means they're the perfect candidates to enter into the mass, into the mystery of our liturgy. Because when that wine is poured in the chalice and then the few drops of water, they get it. They see the mystery. They feel the mystery. And, and when we present that in the atrium and we ask them, what has happened to the water? Can you see it? Can we take it back out? No. What could that mean? And we are in no, no rush to give them an answer to that. Rather, we've opened the door to their, they know there's something really mysterious and big there, but we're in no rush to push them to come to an answer. So uh, in the introduction or forward to one of the earlier versions of the religious potential uh, shared the story of a little boy um, who went by his initials, J.W., but he loved that work in the atrium, the mingling of the water and wine. And he would do it almost every week. Go to the shelf, pour in the wine, put in the few drops of water, stare at it for a minute, and then pour it out. And often he'd do it a second time. But one week, he, his little friend had gone over to do the work. And I saw this unfold, J.W., sort of sauntered over to the shelf where his friend was, sort of had that sort of strut like a big man on campus. And he leaned against the shelf and he said to his friend, you know what that means? And his little friend just stared at him like it had never even occurred to him to think about what it means. He was just enjoying doing it. But J.W. leaned in a little closer and said, it means God and us, we're very close. So <laughs> those are the kinds of big questions that young children think about, ponder. Uh, and the metaphysical child just means they're the ones most open to the mystery of the parable, the mystery of the liturgical moment because of this merging within them of physical physicality and spirituality. They, they live in that world simultaneously. And we lose that so much as we get older. But thankfully, especially with this work of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, as we are learning from the child, at least for myself, I feel like it has opened up a little bit more of that medical metaphysical abilities again to see a little bit of what they see just by journeying with them yes yes and that's you know the whole catechesis of the good shepherd really is um we one could say based on jesus's own 
exhortation to us um, in Matthew 18 when he says, you know, welcome them. They're the greatest in the kingdom. But when he says, and you must change and become like them, that's something I think we as adults pretty quickly dismiss. We don't give it a whole lot of thought because we, you know, we think, oh, he just meant uh, they're very open, they're very trusting, they're very obedient, yeah. um, they're easy, <laughs> right? But in the Catechism of the Good Shepherd, we, we realize so much more that he was calling us to. And yes, I think living at that union of our physical and our spiritual life as one is is one of the things that he was pointing us adults yes. to in the child yes so much depth and um, beauty there that is you have to really yes. be willing to observe and study in order to see yes well, before we finish, Rebecca, I would love to ask you, do you have a story or a moment in the 40 years of you doing this work where I'm sure you have many, but would you share one with us that you were just like, wow, yes, this works. I or fall in love with this work a little bit more because of this moment with the child. Well, I would say this uh, to that. You're right. There are so many. Uh, I keep journals, of course, uh, of every atrium and what the children say and do and so forth. So you're right. It's it's a treasure trove. I'll spend the rest of my life uh, digging through and remembering. But I have to say that the most powerful one that comes to my mind is that, see, I had my Rome training before I had children of my own. And the gift of that training, one of the most unexpected or precious gifts to me was that when I did have children, I felt I had an open heart and mind, an open, I could see things in them. I could notice responses they had that I, I, I would not have noticed. I would not have been attuned to, I think, without the catechesis training. But the one maybe that one of the ones I hold most precious was my own daughter, my oldest daughter, Rachel. And I was a little nervous about her starting the, after my training, I had come to uh, help start Christian Family Montessori, where the atrium was going to be the heartbeat of the school. And I was their first teacher. But when Rachel came along, I, I could no longer uh, be a, a Montessori classroom teacher and catechist, and I could only be a catechist. But one of my prayers was that there would be someone, by the time she was old enough for the atrium, there would be someone trained so I didn't want her to have me as her catechist. I wanted her to experience uh, the catechesis in a little more objectivity, you know, uh, objective uh, mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she was she started the school uh, Christian Family Montessori when she was three and a half in that fall. And in the first year during Advent for a child, the child's first year when they're three, three and a half. We only do two Advent prophecies, and um, there are three others, but we space them out over the hopefully three years they're in the three to six atrium. Um, so this was her first year, and the prophecies she should have received or would have received a formal presentation on were the prophecy of the great light and the prophecy of the names of the Messiah. But one day during Advent, she was at home. I was across the hall in my room. She was in her room across the hall from me, and she w had been sitting at her little table doing some sort of artwork. I was busy in my room, but at a certain moment, I caught her out, out of the corner of my eye. I saw that she came to the threshold of her door, looking up. And she called out, be present 
God in Jesus. And as a mother, <laughs> I was, of course, just, you know, goosebumps and chills. And where did that come from? It was so totally spontaneous. So the following week, I went to her catechist and I said, what did you present to Rachel at Atrium last week? Because we, we generally only gave a new presentation once a week and the rest of the time they were free to go in the atrium and do their own work. But she said, well, let me think. Um, she said, actually, Rachel didn't have a new presentation last week. Um, but I remember that when I was giving the presentation of, we call it the prophecy of the mother, um, it was just, you know, read in the Sunday liturgy yesterday uh, that this young maiden would, would be with child and would soon give birth to a son whom she would call Emmanuel. She said, I remember that she did come through when I was giving that presentation. I remember her stopping and listening. And I know that in the presentation, the catechist says, you know, Emmanuel, another name for Jesus. Emmanuel means God with us. No, that's all. It, we just give them that, the meaning of that word. We don't push it. We don't say, so what does this, who does this mean Jesus is? We just let them hear those words and you know, offer to them that the word Emmanuel means God with us. Those words touched a three and a half year old so deeply that she prayed on her own, be present God in Jesus. Um, once you hear those things and see those things, be it in the atrium in your own home, all the doubt that religion is something we're imposing on our children goes out the window. And we, we see and we know this is who they are. We're just helping them by giving them those announcements that confirm what they already know. Mm. That's a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Rebecca, this has been so wonderful. You are your wisdom and your stories and your experiences is, is a gift to us. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for letting me share these things. The Good Shepherd and the Child podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members for making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. In two weeks, we will have another of our favorite episodes from the last year and a half to share with you. And we will be back with brand new episodes in October of 2021. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.